Welcome back to ECE 207. You can see we have a full agenda today from the screen. I like that, do you? What we have to worry about, this is coming from memory, which is a little scary at this point. What are some announcements? The important announcement is that you have your final exam a week from Thursday. That will be December 16th from 2 p.m., not a.m. 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. That's my understanding. Is that correct? And you should all be here at that particular time to take the final. Today, what I would like to do is give you a class participation opportunity. And that class participation, maybe I should just say it right now so that you can be thinking about it. And we'll do that, I think, at the first of the lecture. And that is write down a topic or a phrase that indicates what you would like to see reviewed or gone over prior to the final. And I'm going to try to tape a few little snips of captured screen that might address those particular issues. If I get 50 that say, oh, I need to have you review this particular topic, then that's maybe what I would do. If I receive 150 individual recommendations, then I may have to just throw them up in the air and see which one comes down first, or I may pick a set. Question? Should we put our name, our ID, or both? You need your code. If you do not remember your code, you need to put your name on that class participation. Is it clear what I'm wanting you to do for class participation? And you can do that now and pass that to one edge. Obviously, there's no right answer. There really hasn't been, there's, there have been correct answers for class participation, but that hasn't been the, mo the motive behind class participation. This does not have a right answer, obviously. That's one thing that I want to cover. I also want to do a little bit of a review for the final. In other words, there's not going to be new material today that you'll have to be responsible for for the final unless it seems new to you. But it should be what we've already been covering this semester. And that will be, the final is going to be comprehensive. And maybe what I should talk just a little bit about is the process. And we're not going to go the full 75 minutes today. We will go 74 and I'll give you the TCEs no. Hopefully, I will be able to watch the clock and we'll go until about maybe 425 because this is a big class and I want you to not be delayed because of TCEs, but I would like you to participate and fill that out and give me good feedback on the TCE form. Well, meaningful feedback. Uh, that was maybe a poor choice of words. It doesn't all have to be good necessarily, but I want you to give me your honest feedback on the TCEs. And I don't receive those until after grades have been posted. You don't have to worry about that. I think that's clear, I hope, at this point. So that's the third thing on my goal. Let's start, you already have done your class participation, hopefully, and if you joined us late, you can hopefully figure out what the class participation was. Make sure it gets to one of the ends of the rows before class is dismissed. And I'm going to leave early, obviously, for the TCEs once I get a volunteer to do that. In terms of the final exam, It will be comprehensive. It's our fourth exam. I'm not sure I want to do this, but four sheets of notes. Hopefully you can keep track of those. And again, they're restricted in size. 
to be eight and a half inches by 11 inches. Pardon? No scrolls. If you want to print very, very small, you may, but you're restricted to that particular size. And this can be front and back. I may try to put together a little bit of a review topic list, but I'm not sure that's necessary. It's going to be the material that, have all, that has already been covered on exams one, two, and three, and subsequent material since exam three, but I don't think I'm going to overemphasize the material that happened post exam number three. I'll try to uniformly cover the material. Question? Will there be pretty much one question per topic or, or would you? Will there be one question for per topic? I'm going to try to be somewhat uniform in my coverage of material for the final if that makes any sense. I'm not sure that I can guarantee there will only be one or there will be one per topic, but I, I hope to hit the material in a uniform, consi uniformly consistent way. Question? Yes, you will be tested on diodes and that diode material. And you can use the homework assignments to get ready for that material. Obviously, we have not been able to take an exam. I guess we could take an exam if you want Thursday, this Thursday. <laughs> but I will hope the question was, can I post a sample one? I'm going to try to based on what feedback you give me in the class participation, I might write up some example problems on those. That's what I'm thinking about doing now. Question? Um, Three-phase power, three power is fair game, yes. And just because you asked that doesn't mean that that's why it's fair game. So you're, you shouldn't hold that against whoever asked that question. That was already on the table, three-phase power will be on the table. Other questions? Speaking of power, let's look at some review problems. Suppose you're given the following question, and here's the system. We have, we'll call this load one, and we'll have a second load, load two. Load one, let's say P1 is 10 W, PF1 is 0 0.8 lagging, load two, we're told is Z sub 2 is 1 minus J2. And feeding or supplying those two loads is a source, and we'll make that a voltage source. We'll call it V sub S, 12 at an angle of 0 degrees, and that voltage is in RMS. <coughs> That's our configuration, which you should be ready to do by the final exam. In terms of understanding this particular configuration, I haven't yet asked a question. I guess that's what I need to do next. Suppose the question for this configuration is the power factor of the source. Let's say that's a question on the final. And there may be, well, I don't know how many questions there are going to be. I have no idea. But you have two hours this time. You had 75 minutes before. So you'll have a little bit more time. The final might be a little longer, but I don't think it's going to be 
proportionately longer in plan to be longer than the one, that proportionality relationship longer than the <laughs> one hour. Sorry, it's Tuesday. Que question or did that answer your question? Surprised that phrase answered anybody's question, but let's now look at this one, which is the power factor of the source. How do we do that? Does anybody remember? Is this three phase? Is this a three phase problem? No. no. I don't have three phases. It's a single phase problem. And I'm wanting to find the power factor of the source. The thing that I find, I think you're starting to learn or get comfortable with is that there's not just one way to solve these problems. There could be 20 different ways to solve this problem. Some might be a little easier, but they may be only easier for you versus they may not be so easy for your classmate to solve it the way that you solved it. It's whichever way you find more comfortable or meaningful for you to solve the problem. What can we do in this particular case or what are we looking for in terms of the power factor of the source? What does the power factor represent? Cosine theta. If it's cosine theta and you write that on your exam and the problem was worth 20 points, that might get you one, right? Because you have to basically tell me what is theta. Theta could be a lot of things because I have several things here. I have one, I have two loads and I have a source. And if you simply write down theta, I could be really difficult and say, I don't know what you mean by theta. Okay, theta is the angle between the real component of your complex power and the the hypotenuse, but that's the apparent power, isn't it? So your apparent power gives you the magnitude of your, or length of your hypotenuse, or you could find theta many different ways. If you have a triangle, which you do with complex power, you have a right triangle, you can find that angle if you're given two sides, if you're given an angle. Was there a question somewhere else? Yes, no. Let's try to think about what we could do. First of all, that voltage of 12 volts at zero degrees is across both loads. And that tells us something, or that might allow us to think about finding the current flowing into each of these respective loads. Let's say I sub 1 and I sub 2. Or what else do you know about the, and I may dance around this solution just so that we sort of review different topics as we're going through it. But if I was interested in the complex power of the total, that's simply the sum of the two complex powers. But remember, that complex power is a complex number. It has two components to it. It has a real part and an imaginary part, and you're now adding those up, keeping those two pieces together. S sub 1 has a P1 and a Q1, and those are orthogonal to each other. And S sub 2 has a P sub 2 and a Q sub 2. And you have to make sure you keep track of all of those. Another way of thinking about this total complex power, that's what we're using to the S variable for. We could also think of that in polar form, or there might be the theta that we're after, theta sub t, where our power factor of the total system is now the cosine of theta sub t. That's what we're after. Pictorially, 
you could think of, well, let's now look at what we have. That's what we want, but we don't really yet have all of the total complex power. We were given information about load one and load two. What kind of information in our first load were we given? What's P1 tell us? That's the real power. That's our average power. And which way is that directionally? That's in the x direction, isn't it? That's in our real direction. P1 is 10. And what else are we told with load 1? We're told the cosine of theta 1, so we could find theta 1 from that. And given that we're lagging, what kind of a load are we seeing? Inductive or capacitive? It's inductive. That gives us a lagging power factor. And that corresponds to a positive complex Q. So our reactive power Q is positive. And we can now think of this power triangle looking something like this. Let's say this is now our angle theta 1. We're given this length. We are indirectly given theta 1. Power factor of 1 is the cosine of theta 1, which is 0 0.8. That's what we were told. And we can solve that now for theta 1 using the inverse cosine. And did anybody do that? That's theta 1. And my diagram may not be very true in representing that, but that's not the critical piece. Now that we have theta 1 identified, we can find a lot of other things. This is now the length of our apparent power. That's our hypotenuse. And we have these other relationships between P, Q, and S. P1, the real power, if we wanted to find it just based on trig, is the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta 1. Or that's S1 times the cosine of theta 1. But the cosine of theta 1 is power factor 1. And we're given PF sub 1 and we're given P1. We can find the magnitude of our apparent power. S1 is now this P1 over cosine of theta sub 1, which is 0.8. Or we now have S1 is equal to 10. And that was just in watts. We didn't have kilowatt as far as a prefix to that or as an index over 0 0.8. And what is that? Bless you. Now we have an apparent power magnitude for load one of 12 and a half. What are the units again? I'm sorry? What are, the units again? what are the units on our apparent power? Does anyone remember? And you need to know, obviously, by the final. This is volt amperes, isn't it? VA. P is W. And Q, what are those units? VARs, volt amperes reactive. And that's what we can now find if we want to. We can now find Q1. Q1 is S1 sine of theta 1. And that now allows us to write the total complex power, which did anybody figure out what K1 or Q1 is? I didn't. 7.51.
that's now our complex power associated with load one and we know that this sign is positive because we were told it was a lagging power factor or we now have an inductive load. So if we wanted S1, we have it. And then we can find S2 if we want it. How might we do that? Well, let's just go through some of these relationships for complex power. In load two, all we were given was the impedance. But we also know the voltage dropped across that impedance. That was our source voltage. In this case, what is the complex power S in terms of voltage and current? It needs to be V times I sub 2 star, doesn't it? Where I sub 2 star is the conjugate of our current through that particular load. And we know these are phasors By Ohm's law, we know that V2 is equal to Z sub 2, I sub 2. And what do we know? Well, in this particular problem, we know V sub 2, we know Z sub 2, we can now solve for I sub 2. Then we could find its conjugate and multiply that conjugate times V sub 2 to get our complex power for load 2 meaning I sub 2 is just V2 over Z2. If you wanted to write that in to the complex power formula, and you should be very comfortable with doing these complex algebra manipulations, this is now V2 over Z2 conjugated or this is now V sub 2, V sub 2 bar conjugate over Z sub 2 conjugate. And what is V2 times its conjugate? Do we remember? And if you've forgotten maybe before the final, you need to just remind yourself, suppose V2 was some generic complex number A plus JB. And I guess I could give you some gifts on the final. That might not be unheard of. If I said, here's V2, what's V2 star? Would that be a gift? That's now A minus JB. If I now take V2, and multiply it by its conjugate. Do you remember? I don't know. I never learned it this way. I just know how to multiply them out. But FOIL, does that make sense to you? First, outer, inner, and last. Don't ask me to repeat that in a week, but for some reason I remember it today. What happens when you apply or multiply these two together? Your first terms square. Your last terms, you have JB times minus JB, but J squared is minus one. That cancels the negative sign. And this inner and outer cancel. We have JAB minus JAB. This result gives us that. That's just a squared plus B squared, which if those were lengths of a triangle, which you could rep represent this complex number as a real part and an imaginary part, and you now have a triangle, that's the hypotenuse of that triangle squared. Or that's the magnitude squared, which says if we put that into here, V2 times its conjugate is just the magnitude of V2 squared divided by the conjugate of z sub 2.
or this is now v sub 2 squared and v sub 2 as far as its magnitude is concerned was the square root of a squared plus b squared. And we can write this complex power a lot of ways. We now have v2 times i2 star. We could write v2 in terms of z2 and i sub 2. We just derived what x times x star is. That's just its magnitude squared, or s2 is z2 times the magnitude of i2 squared. For our example, we don't have to derive all of those. We can just use one of those formulas, whichever one seems to fit for you. We have the complex power. Let's say that's equal to v2 squared over the conjugate of z2. Our magnitude of the voltage was 12. We can square that. Our impedance was 1 minus J2. We need to take the conjugate of that. Or now we have 144 over 1 plus J2. And that's now S sub 2 bar, or the complex power of load 2. Once we have that, now we're in a position to combine Do I need, I would need help with doing that math if you want me to work this through. Is it okay if I just do what I'm doing now and ex assume you can do the math? S2 bar is just a real part and an imaginary part, which you could find many different ways. You could multiply by one, where one would be a, a convenient value of 1 would be the conjugate of the denominator, or you could convert the denominator into a magnitude and an angle, and then the magnitudes just divide and your angle is subtracted. It's however you feel more comfortable doing that manipulation. But once you have that, now you have P total plus JQ total, which is P1 plus JQ1 plus P2 plus JQ2, and we're simply combining the real parts and the reactive parts of the individual loads to obtain, that was a 2, P1 plus P2 plus JQ1, Q2. And we can now say that theta total is this inverse tangent of QT over PT. And the power factor total is the cosine of theta sub T. And what am I missing? You would need to indicate whether that was leading or lagging, and without me going through the numbers, I don't, I can't say. But how would I determine whether it was leading or lagging? What tells me that information? If I gave you the P's and the Q's, could you tell me whether it was leading or lagging? And what would you be looking for? You want to know is Q subtotal negative or positive? If it's positive, it's inductive, it's lagging. If it's negative, it's 
capacitive and it's negative. Or what that's what I just said. It's leading. If the Q is negative, it's leading. I tried to say that, maybe I did not. I think I said it in a roundabout way, if I said it at all. Down is leading, up is lagging. Down is up is lagging in terms of drawing the direction of. That's just one way to solve it. You could have solved it other ways. You could have found the currents and then you just need to know the relationship between the voltage phasor and the current phasor and that gives you the angle of the total and you could take the cosine of that total angle to get your power factor of the total. Let's, are there questions on that problem? How about we look at I think this is probably where everybody feels the least warm and fuzzy. Maybe, if I had to guess, phasor circuits. And when I speak of steady state in a phasor circuit, what am I referring to? This, I think, was not completely understood. Okay, so after the switch has been closed, the transient terms have gone away. We may have some transient, but now we have this sinusoidal steady state. That does not mean we're in a DC steady state behavior. We're in a sinusoidal. If we're talking phasers, we're then assuming that we're applying a sinusoidally varying waveform as either a voltage or a current. Suppose I give you the following circuit. A current source, I sub S of T, an inductor, let's say that inductor is 100 millihenries, and we have a resistor of 1 and a capacitor of 1 over 30. Suppose somebody tells you that the source current is 5 cosine of 30T. And I could ask you a lot of different questions just given that circuit. I could ask what's the impedance, complex impedance of the inductor? That should be a gift. What's the complex impedance of the capacitor? That should be a gift. Z sub L, the complex impedance is, what did I, was, I thought I said inductor, did I not? What's the inductor's impedance? Okay, it's J omega L is how I remember it. But what's, what's critical so far that I've given you in terms of sometimes it, you need it initially, but eventually maybe you lose track of it, but it should still be on the side of your napkin or on your paper. Omega, the frequency. What is the frequency of oscillation in this circuit? That's this number, and you need to remember the units. Is that 30 hertz? That's radians per second, which you should remember that's related to hertz by this 2 pi. And in subsequent material, you might need to know what the time, the period of that oscillating frequency is. That's the inverse of F, so omega is 2 pi over cap T. I simply remember that F and 1 over T are reciprocally related. F is cycles per second. T is time in seconds. That's your period, capital T. So if you needed any of those, you have them once you're given omega. Or I could have given you 
something that was in terms of 2 pi if I wanted to. I could have said that's equal to 16 pi t or something. And then you would maybe know what your frequency was. It would be 8, 8 hertz. But I gave it to you in radians per second. Now that we have that information identified, we can transform this circuit from the time domain into the frequency domain or write our phasor circuit for it. If we're doing that, our phasor circuit requires these complex impedances, which means I could probably give you one problem, well, close to, maybe I could give you a couple of problems that would test the entire semester's material. And then it's either right or wrong and it's easy to grade. I have not decided. So the question was what kind of exam am I writing and I don't know yet. So it will probably have some multiple choice. It may just have a lot of multiple choice. Some of those might be find Z sub R. Would that be a hard problem? Yeah, that would really be hard. It shouldn't be. That should be considered a gift. Z sub R is R, right? It doesn't depend on frequency. Can you give what? us the gifts on this exam that you didn't give us on your own? <laughs> <laughs> What if I said I gave you a lot of gifts on the earlier? Would that make you feel very comfortable for the final? <laughs> so Z sub C, the impedance of a capacitor, is 1 over J omega C. That's now, we could put the J upstairs if we wanted to by saying, well, that's equivalent to minus J. Omega is 30. And what was C? Conveniently, it was 1 over 30. This is now minus J for Z sub C. The inductor's impedance was J omega L. Omega again was 30. L was a tenth or 100 millihenries. That's now J3. And we are able to now write a phasor circuit which looks like this one should be easy. That's just a copy of what it was. What's our capacitor impedance? That was minus J. Our inductor's impedance was J3, and what's this source look like? We've now moved out of the time domain into the frequency or phasor domain. What do we need for the current source? We need the magnitude, which was 5, and we need its angle, which was 0. And on the side of the paper, if we need to go back into the time domain, we need to remember that omega was equal to 30. Now I could ask you some more questions. I could ask you, what's this voltage between A and B? One way to find that, and it wouldn't be, have to be, but I think it might be helpful to just try to find the equivalent impedance of that combination. What's Z equivalent? If, and if that makes you not feel very comfortable, I would just mentally, or maybe even on your paper, I would start replacing those complex impedances with resistors and say, how would I solve this if, the, if these were just resistors? 
I would add up the one and this capacitor's impedance, and that combination is in, par in parallel with the inductor's impedance, meaning Z equivalent is now going to be this inductor's impedance in parallel with the series combination of the resistor and the capacitor's impedance, which is just their sum, or 1 minus J. And these complex quantities combine just like the resistors combine structurally. It's just we have to keep track of the complex math. This is now J3 times 1 minus J all over their sum. And we could solve that a lot of different ways. If I look at J3, I could write that as 3 at 90 degrees. Since I'm trying to do a product and quotient, it might be easier or more convenient to convert these to polar form, magnitudes and angles. What's 1 at minus J? I like to visualize the picture. That's now something that's going over 1 and down 1. That's now this particular vector, and it's that angle. So here were my two sides, which are 1 and 1. That's just a right triangle with sides of 1. The hypotenuse is the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared, or it's the square root of 2. So that 1 minus j looks like the square root of 2, and it has an angle of minus 45 degrees. Are we okay with where that came from? That's just the 1 minus j written as a polar complex number. Then the denominator is 1 plus j2 which I need to put that into polar form. I have the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared at an angle of the inverse tangent of 1, or that's now the square root of 5 at 63.43 degrees. If you start putting all of those pieces together, then hopefully it's clear that Z equivalent is equal to 3 times the square root of 2 divided by the square root of 5, that ends up being, I think I've done the algebra, that's a little bit less than 2. And the angle should be a little bit, well, it should be negative by the amount, 63, being larger than 45, or that's minus 18.43 degrees. I now could mentally or even pictorially change or re-sketch this. This is now Z equivalent A, B. Here's my source. And hopefully it's clear that V sub AB is just Z equivalent times the current 5 at 0 degrees. And Z equivalent I had already written in polar form. That was 1.897. At an angle of minus 18.43 degrees. That's times 5 at 0 degrees. And I should end up with a number a little bit smaller than 10, 
which is 9.487, and my angle I just add those angles, They're, I'm multiplying those two numbers, that's V sub AB. That's in the, free, in the phasor domain, that's maybe not the actual answer that I want. What's the time domain expression for V sub AB of T? How might you find an inaccurate answer just by plugging numbers into your calculator if you're given that formula? This is an abusive notation that's, cons that's commonly used. What was 30? That was radians per second. What's this? That's degrees. What's this quantity going to be in? Radians. So we're adding radians to degrees. You have to convert one to the other and make sure your calculator is in the mode of whatever you're converting to. You just have to make sure that you're not adding apples and oranges, radians to degrees. You have to either be adding degrees or radians. And I hope we remember the relationship, right? We have 2 pi radians equaling 360 degrees. And if you need to convert back and forth, you can, depending on what you have, so if you have 30 radians and you want to convert that to 2 degrees, I hope it's clear that you could simply, and a lot of times you just have that to be 180 divided by pi. That's now your way of converting these radians into degrees. Is that okay? So we basically have a large number which would get multiplied by t because this would now be degrees per second that we need to multiply by t and then subtract this 18.43 degrees from. And that's assuming our calculator was in the degree mode when we were computing the cosine. Questions on that? But this would be an acceptable final answer even though the argument on that cosine expression is inconsistent, but that's convention that you write that as omega t plus or minus some radians or some degrees. Questions on that? What if we had the following? And suppose somebody wanted to know what is I1. I hope it's clear that I1 is not equal to 10 divided by 2. Right? You can't just neglect all of this. You could form the equivalent of that that I've circled, and I think I already heard people doing that. This combines pretty quickly, doesn't it? Those two are in parallel. 
and the parallel combination just cuts each one in half to give us our, or cuts one of those in half to give us our equivalent, and that's two. Then we have a two and a two and a one in series, so that I1 now becomes 10 divided by two plus two plus one, or two amps. If I ask for this current, could you give me that current? How is I3 related to I1? What happens, well, if I didn't see it, I would say, well, let me call this one I2, and then I'm playing with what's really coming or happening at that particular node. If I'm coming to the right with I1, I'm coming at a, a volume of two amps, I think. Didn't I just say that? Two amps for I1. What do I see when I come to this juncture at the road? I see two paths. One path is four ohms. Well, it's not quite because it has something below it, but each one has the same amount below it. Is that clear? They both have one hanging on their tail. And I see another one that looks four plus a one. So what's going to happen relative to I2 and I3? Half, is, half of I1 is going to go through I2, the other half is going to go through I sub 3, and so I sub 3 is 1. And that should make sense because now, what would you expect to come out of that node? If I created that green super node, and I said, oh, what's the current coming out of that green super node? Has to be the same as what went in. What went in was I1, I4 better be 2. And it's equivalently the sum of I2 plus I3. That stuff should be starting to feel very warm and fuzzy for you. Questions on that? Yes? The question, I think, that was just raised was, what are my units on this particular time domain expression? Is it in RMS or is it in absolute? And does it matter? You just need to be consistent, correct? What did I start with? I think I started non-RMS. That was a long time ago, apparently. Five, I didn't say that was, and I didn't label it, that should have been in amps, let's say. I said that's five, that's an absolute number. I didn't convert to RMS, so I don't need to convert back. What I end up with is an absolute magnitude. It's not an RMS unit. And the final answer, was it a voltage, would be in volts in absolute terms. Did that answer your question? So you don't have to convert to RMS to do phasor problems. That's correct. You, you, it's more convenient to convert to phasors when you start doing power problems, because then you don't have to keep track of these square roots of twos and one halves. So you convert up front if you're going to be doing power problems, and then it's just V times I, and you don't have to worry about these square roots of two underneath. That's when it's convenient to find RMS units, is when you're doing power problems, or to play with RMS units. Other questions? Make sure your class participation page is on the side. May I have a volunteer, and I'm going to leave the classroom and hope that somebody can fill this or get this completed 
and I will see you in a little more than a week. I will have office hours. I'll try to post those on D2L. They'll be somewhat consistent, but I'll probably have a little bit more than a normal week.